They're the business deals that shake things up. A turning point in corporate history. That change the way we think. Hostile takeovers. Leverage buyouts. And surprise the street. We're not going to walk away. 1988. As takeover mania sweeps the nation, one of America's most respected corporations is up for grabs. They made rich crackers. They made Oreos. It would cost billions of dollars. Who on earth is going to finance this transaction? And cause a clash of the titans of American business. This really was the closest that Wall Street ever came to a legitimate world war. RJR Nabisco braces for buyout. The hidden dramatic story behind the biggest corporate deal in history. The National Biscuit Company, AKA Nabisco, best known for Oreos and Ritz crackers. By the 1980s, the Atlanta-based corporation is the fourth largest food seller in the nation. Its executives joked that you could pretty much run it on autopilot. I mean, it was not exactly a hard-charging American industrial corporation until Ross Johnson came along. An executive regarded as a financial genius with an easygoing style and an affinity for lavish executive perks, F. Ross Johnson epitomizes the freewheeling 1980s. I mean, the way Ross ran the company was essentially to get all his, his buddies together, who were senior executives, go out in the town, have an, you know, an all-night drinking session, throw around a bunch of ideas. Um, some of them were goofy, some of them were brilliant, and Ross would try anything. But after four years of solid cash earnings, Nabisco's stock is stagnant. In 1985, Ross Johnson contemplates a possible solution. We just couldn't grow fast enough on our own. We had a strong international base, which was unique. We did about 40% of our business outside the United States. Uh, but at the same time, we just needed even more critical mass. In order to expand Nabisco and raise its stock price, Ross Johnson orchestrates one of the most controversial mergers of the time, one that will marry his wholesome food seller with an industry many view as a merchant of death. The tobacco giant Johnson Quartz is century-old, cash-rich R.J. Reynolds. In June 1985, R.J. Reynolds agrees to purchase Nabisco for a cool $4.9 billion, forming R.J.R. Nabisco. Within a year, Johnson is named CEO, with his hand on the controls of what is now the nation's 19th largest corporation. He's ready to do what he likes best. Ross believed in business as fun. Lots of corporate jets, lots of limos, lots of kind of uh, sports legends and friends came on. You have to have some fun. Look, at if we have to put a man on the moon, that's serious. <laughs> I mean, that's really serious. I would be quite upset if I had to do that. But, you know, when, you, when you're selling peanuts and you're selling dog food, and, you know, I mean, it's... It's great, but, uh, you know, it's not rocket science. But in 1987, the very thing that Johnson hoped would bring his company's stock to new heights becomes an albatross. In the late 80s, a spate of lawsuits against big tobacco claim that cigarettes are killing Americans. The controversy decimates RJR Nabisco's stock. Once riding high in the 70s, it now languishes in the 50s. RJR was mired uh, at the price it was at because tobacco was viewed as a, uh, an increasingly high-risk investment as tobacco litigation uh, really took hold. I think Ross, his learning curve was different. Uh, he couldn't understand why there wasn't instant magic in this, in this marriage of these two companies. And I think that led to his impatience to, uh, to do something. Johnson had looked at all sorts of schemes to inflate the stock price. Spin-offs, recapitalizations. He had a couple of fellows over on the side who were always doing numbers. They were like mad scientists back in the laboratory, trying to come up with ways that would goose the stock up. But nothing really worked. So the question was, uh, well, what do you do? Johnson's answer was as simple as it was revolutionary. If the stock is RJR Nabisco's main problem, why not eliminate it? 
To do just that, he begins to investigate a technique quickly becoming the deal of its time, the leveraged buyout, or LBO. In an LBO, a form of corporate takeover, a private company raises capital from the sale of junk bonds and bank loans and buys a public company trading on the stock exchange. Everybody wants to make the leverage buyout a complicated concept. It's simple. Let's say you go buy a farm and you borrow from the bank. You, you get a mortgage to buy the farm. You use the farm's cash flow, the chickens and the hens, to pay down your debt and to pay down larger chunks of the debt and to make a little bit of money, you sell off a few barns, you sell off a few acres in the back 40. That's exactly what an LBO is. For Johnson, the LBO could be the magic bullet to solve RJR Nabisco's stock problems once and for all. In 1987, with the takeover mentality at its peak, it isn't long before Wall Street senses that RJR Nabisco and Ross Johnson are ripe for the picking. He was a magnet to the Wall Street investment bankers. They circled him like moths to a, a light bulb on a hot summer night. By September, the man most attracted to the light is Henry Kravis. Henry Kravis's company, Colbert Kravis Roberts, or KKR, has orchestrated leveraged buyouts of numerous corporate giants, including the most expensive to date. KKR's revolutionary deals are engineered by Henry Kravis and his cousin, George Roberts. In the mid-80s, Henry Kravis was the king of the leverage buyout. For Henry Kravis, RJR Nabisco was the white whale. It was the one. RJR Nabisco was an incredible cash flow machine. Uh, it threw off a lot of cash. It was a very attractive uh, company in that, in that sense. However, by the mid-1980s, critics claimed that LBOs are forcing companies to make huge layoffs, to take on crippling debt, and to sell off valuable company assets to pay back that debt. And while Ross Johnson is a proven risk taker, he has mixed feelings about LBOs. Basically, you're, you're buying out your current shareholders at hopefully a very good price, but then you're taking it on, and you're taking it on with debt. And then life becomes one long, dreary succession of balance sheets. <laughs> it's like shoveling snow. And shoveling through endless paperwork wasn't Ross Johnson's style. But in September 1987, despite his ambivalence to LBOs, Ross Johnson accepts a private dinner invitation from buyout king Henry Kravis. He finally managed to entice Ross up to New York, had him to dinner in his apartment, palatial apartment, the ultimate New York apartment. Monet, Renoir, I mean, just a, a sergeant, uh, beautiful apartment. Ross was impressed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the art was real terrible. It was a beautiful place, beautiful place. And the food was extremely good. That night, under the gaze of priceless works of art, Kravis sings the praises of LBOs, trying to convince Johnson to pursue a transaction with KKR. Ross realized that this guy didn't get to be this rich by letting other people run the companies that he bought. Ross Johnson looks across the table and knows that if he goes forward with an LBO with Henry Kravis, he might make millions. But he's looking at his future boss. Henry Kravis didn't get where he was by being a nice guy. He was cold-eyed, eye on the bottom line, type of fella. And I said, well, I've looked at LBOs, and, and I understand what they can do, and, uh, but I don't know if it's, you know, it's my style. Ross didn't want to work for anybody, least of all Henry Kravis. If he was going to do an LBO, he wanted a different kind of an LBO, one that he would run, not the Wall Street financiers. And I went back and talked with our advisors and felt, no, it just really wasn't the answer for us. Ross Johnson and Henry Kravis part amicably that night in New York City. But only a year later, the two would become combatants in the biggest corporate battle in the history of Wall Street. For Henry Kravis, RJR Nabisco was the white whale. It was the one. 